Paul Oneman, uh, it's the scheduled September meeting of the Public Safety Committee in Anchorage Assembly. Uh, it is now officially time 12.03 p.m. And uh, I am Paul Oneman, I'm the chair currently of the Public Safety Committee, and with me are my colleagues from the Assembly and Public Committee. Great training, Anchorage Assembly. Tell me great Dale. And Ms. Great Jackson, Mr. Train, of course, are uh, the members of the committee as well as Mr. Hall. He was uh, running a little bit uh, behind, he's at a meeting, and he said he would endeavor to be here before. Uh, too much longer and try to get here by 1230 at the latest. I have another, a number of matters before the committee today and uh, I know that we, we put, uh, we knew we had scheduled the taxi cab uh, ordinance changes that Mr. Traney has and if you haven't already received uh, one, there's copies at this table, uh, square table as you walk in on, if you follow my hand on this day, it's on the uh, west side of the building and as you go in the entrance and there's a few of those left. Also there's an agenda, there may be one or two of those left so you can follow along. As well as there should be a sign-in sheet that's going around. Does anybody know where that's at? Okay, good. Uh, I've got it right here. Perfect, start. perfect. If you guys don't mind signing in, please, and just put a phone number and an email so we can contact you for future matters and to let us know who we have here. Uh, if we get to the point where we're asking you questions or if there's some presentation, if you'll sit at the two end chairs here for, uh, for those that uh, can and uh, give us your name again on record since it's on tape. Uh, we may know who you are on the sign it, but we won't know who you are unless you identify yourself. So that's kind of the rules. Uh, I think I already talked to you about uh, in case there's an emergency, make sure you don't block the doors. We can go straight out the front door if you came in, I'm sure. And there's also other exits that mark clearly it says exit, exit, in case we have to go out another uh, egress. You need to go to the restroom, men's to this side, women's to this side, and I think that's about all the housekeeping matters I need to do. Uh, so we'll move on to business now. Ordinarily, we would have the uh, department heads, uh, representatives from the departments to speak on, on their behalf, but we know that the fire chief will not be here. Is that right, Christy? Correct. Uh, so no one for fire. My colleagues here. And I'm going to give a few moments for the police. Have you heard back from Chief New or anybody? No, I'm not. Okay. Well, we do know that emergency management is here. Yeah. So if you just go ahead and identify yourself and let us know. I'm Rob Fish. I'm with the Office of Emergency Management. And... Uh, about the other things that we have going on in September, everybody knows it's a preparedness month, uh, so we ask everybody please get involved, look at building a uh, personal kit uh, for yourselves and your uh, loved ones. Uh, October 4th uh, will be our continuation of the brown bag lunch uh, events that are held at the uh, BP Building Learning Center, and they're from noon to uh, 1 o'clock, and uh, this time it will be on personal preparedness and winter preparation. Uh, and Presently, we're working towards the Alaska Shield uh, exercise, which is a large-scale uh, exercise. It's uh, nationwide, this one. Uh, we'll have involvement from not only uh, the cities uh, and the towns throughout Alaska, but the governor's going to participate, and also the White House will be participating in this exercise. And that will be in March, of, uh, 20, March 28th of 2014. That's what we have done. Uh, I one follow up to Mr. Fitch. Uh, uh, in October, is it still a plan? And I'm, maybe you're not office not coordinating uh, in the library something to do with emergency preparedness or something. That's right. through the uh, Department of Health. Uh, we'll still be conducting the, uh, the zombie test. Uh, thing. Can you just explain briefly so if you know what you know of it, so we can? Yeah, uh, the zombie fest. Uh, it, it's a uh, fun way of people uh, learning about preparedness and uh, learning about. Uh, different programs. Uh, the Department of Health will be leading it up. It'll be here at Lusac Library and we'll have uh, several vendors going around uh, uh, demonstrating about preparedness, about how to better prepare yourself in uh, influenza or whatever, you know, different uh, case scenarios, uh, you know, winter preparedness, uh, different things like that. But that's led by the Department of Health. So, so basically it sounds kind of goofy, but Zombie Fest, what they do is I think they sprinkle these colored dust or whatever uh -huh. all around and as they lead you through parts of the library, uh, you may get covered with it and it goes to show you how quick you can get exposed to pandemics or, you know, germs, the illness, diseases, things like that. I believe the fire department will also be participating in that event. Right. And what day, do you remember when it was? I Anyone from health department? Did you hear back from the health department? Uh, uh, the health department here? Uh, we'll uh, hold the uh, health and service 
Human Services and let's hopefully recommend the shows. Uh, so Chief Mew, I know if you're prepared, uh, we're moving into the department uh, reports and uh, Mr. Pitch from the open just finished up on uh, brown bag and prepared this month. And, uh, so we, we're looking to see, I guess, some information about APD. I know you've got an academy you're still planning. Academy starts on November 4th. Uh, we have 19 in the academy. Um, we're, we made uh, 20 or 21 job offers. A couple of them took another career path. But, uh, 19. So that's a little bit, that's 10 lower than what we'd like to have. Um, we plan right now to have one in 2014 as soon as this one is excused. So we'll run them through April them into FTOs and then try and hold a hopefully full academy in May of 2014. <coughs> so we've reconstituted the background unit. We have new members reporting at the October 1 turnover turnaround. Um, we're going to repost. We're going to go to a new test, new written test. You may recall that the first first step is screening down at City Hall, and then the next step is to send people to a written test. We've been using the, um, uh, you remember the video test called um, uh, Frontline Video and a uh, name slipped in my mind right now. We, we've been using that for about 15 years and it's worked well for us, but those last two goals, we realized we haven't used it since 2008 until these last two academies. So that's what we're seeing now, both the 2011 Academy and the 2013 Academy is that test is washing out people. That video test, video graphic. Yeah, yeah. Video, frontline video or ergo, ergo, ergo metric. Ergo ergo metric. Ergo. It's washing people out at a higher rate than it did when we used it historically. I don't know the reason why, but we're beginning to suspect the new generation of, of workers is to think differently. You know, it, it measures your logic, your prioritization of, of information, and maybe it's not working our benefit right now. We are aware of some really sharp candidates that can't seem to pass it. So um, we've gone out and have a new uh, contract with an, uh, a firm that has an online computer-based test. Um, and the nice thing about it, we hope the nice thing about it, is that uh, it's a nationwide test that different departments subscribe to. So you can take it, this test anywhere in the lower 48 where there's a testing site, typically at a police department who participates in the same program, sometimes at a university or a junior college or something like that. So we could have, all you got to do is when you take the test, you click all the departments you want to apply for, essentially, or test for. Um, so you could be testing for 10 different departments at one time, and you don't have to travel in order to do it. So this could work in our favor by getting a lot of people from outside, uh, throwing their hat in the ring here in Anchorage. Or it could work the other way around, where anchor people are testing in Phoenix and Orlando or something. So we don't know yet how that's going to work out, but we know what we did, what we were doing this time, seems to not be working for us. So you know, we're going to regroup on that one. So that's kind of where we are again. Oh, we're also considering, and we will try and pull off a lateral academy sometime during 2014. So we try and get an academy and a half through, um, see if we can bring some people across from other agencies, whether that's in the state or outside, who have uh, law enforcement certificates, but they need to be brought up to have a shorter academy break to learn the local stuff, local ordinances, you know, our local policies, like that. Okay. Um, anything? Uh, that come to our mind. I know we're, we should be getting the budget here in October, I believe. And uh, anything that we need to be aware of that needs for the department on, on the public personnel. Obviously. Well, the, the budget situation that you'll see, I wasn't prepared to get into it in detail. I know the mayor hasn't presented it to you formally yet. But um, as you know, our, our problem for next year is trying to hire fast enough to keep up with the a lot of people are going to go out the door before January 4th. It's a one-time anomaly, and they are flooding to the door. We have already surpassed our usual, very reliable, 
very predictable attrition rate of 20. So we passed that this summer, and uh, there's going to be more to go before the end of the year. So hiring and recruiting and training fast enough to keep up with that will be our challenge. I know we're going to have open positions next year that I will not be able to fill. Um, so what I ask in the budget, instead of cutting, um, they wanted to see a lot of non-labor cuts. Well, we don't really have anything left in non-labor. We've cut non-labor for three years. So I'm actually increasing my non-labor a little bit and just asking to use the salary savings that I know I'm going to have um, to offset that and also offset some problems at fire and, and a couple other departments that are would face deep cuts if we're able to rescue them this year. Because frankly, I think even in the most, even in the rosiest <coughs> projection, I still think I'm going to have some open positions I just will not be able to fill next year. So I'm asking the mayor's office and, uh, and um, the CFO to keep those open positions, keep them on the books, keep them funded, allow those funds to be used to offset other departments' problems next year, and then, then they'll still be there the next year when I'm hopefully getting to the place where I can fill those. So I, I, I'm hoping that we fill next year 28, uh, maybe 42 positions, but I think there's going to be 10 or so that uh, will materialize along the way or that will be vacant from the beginning that we'll never get to. James, could you give us a listing next month as to why people are retiring or quote leaving? Just break it down for us so we can see if there's a trend and what we can do to educate the trend. You say there's a one time advantage to them leaving in January, is it? Yeah, that has to do with the concessions that the union voted to accept when acting mayor claimant was at the helm. Uh, that was right after the crash in 2008 and the city realized that they had expensive labor contracts and also that their revenues were declining because of the, the, um, the crash. And so uh, what the mayor did is he asked the union for concessions that, if I wasn't here at the time, but the way it's been explained to me is that the union put off raises and extended the contract by yet another year, so it turned into a five or six year contract you know, was actually with all the raises at the tail end. Um, and then, because some people would retire before they would ever, they put off the raises, but retire and not ever get them. So those old timers, if you will, um, would be reluctant to vote for such a concession. So the sweetener was <coughs> negotiated that said, well, if you retire before a certain date, then you'll get a lump sum cash out. And that cash out rolls into your, uh, the calculation for your retirement. So there's a drop dead date on that. That drop dead date is January 4th, 2014. So the chickens from 2008 have come over the roost. So we're having our normal 20 people leaving. And on top of that, anybody who's got 20 years on, you're a fool if you don't leave. Um, so they're leaving. And that's really the reason right there. Now people will say, well, folks, you know, AO 37, or the threat of layoffs. You know, that's you know, we're working through all the, the morale issues and stuff like that. But I think really the reason is we've got portable retirements and there's this big cash incentive to go. So um, I think that's the reason. Well, 2008, you, you and I were here when we were here at the time. It was a small two-year period. I wasn't here. 2008. Thank Kevin said, I didn't vote for that labor contract. But anyway, um, the mayor said at the State of the City address Monday that he was going to, he's planning to turn the city budget by $5 million. So, I'd just like to know what help we can give you with your budget after he releases. I know you can't tell us anything now, but after he releases the budget, tell us how we can help you, what type of funding you need to keep what you do viable. I will. I, I'll tell you, quite honestly, I was, that I was pleased that we seem to have gone through this thing smoothly this year. Um, I, I got approval to increase some spending in some areas where I really needed to increase them. They're small areas, but, but I have the administration's support there. And I don't know that, uh, frankly, I'm going to have money left on the table next year. And so with that going on, I, I don't feel like I could ask you for more. I, I think there's going to be money I can't spend. And we're going to use that. The plan is to use that money to bail out some other departments that, uh, that are in a worse shape than I am.
Um, Chief, I guess I'd be remiss if I didn't say at least uh, two recent events. I know there was a uh, guy that uh, smashed up a bunch of cars and was at least a couple cars. One of them was stolen as he ran from downtown. The officers ended up uh, pretty close to Mr. Train's house. And one of the neighbors there was actually really helpful. Just right down the end of the street. That's right. Trying to chase him into your front room. Yeah. <laughs> and Paul was saying he was hoping the guy would break into my house. I don't know why. <laughs> but uh, anyway, it's fine work. Uh, I know that it's challenging with uh, you know with all the incidents that vehicles that have been stolen and people that run from the police. But uh, very very good job. And I know there were a lot of resources tied up for a short period. But, uh, you did a good job on that one. And then uh, I can just commend Officer Daly for taking some information, very little information, and, and probably I hope the guy lives with this young man who was uh, found beaten in the van the house. And that there was we did. There were some people on patrol. Who did some extraordinary work that night. I can't discuss it publicly, right. but we took some steps that are unheard of. Um, and, uh, and one of these days we'll be able to talk about it. Right. I just want to say, I know for sure. Well, officer, you probably know. Cause, uh, yeah, there, there, <laughs> yeah. But definitely, the Officer Daly, I know, uh, took the information that he was given. And very little uh, anonymous information and worked real hard on getting a successful resolution, at least finding the victim, and hopefully he'll survive. And then we can uh, pull those accountable. Uh, right now, we are announcing. I have to look at my. I think he's much Marty Pan so I don't know if it's actually come out, but the reporters are flooding into the station, so it must have. But we made the arrest today uh, on the triple rapist, the one that was taking women at gunpoint and dragging them into the bushes. This is the. You know, most of the sexual assaults we have are. They're, they're date rapes, they're people who go willingly with a person and their alcohol is involved, they know them, and then things go bad. I'm not saying they're not legitimate rapists, but, but the kind of thing where the typical Hollywood rapist hiding with a mask in the shadows and snatching a woman walking down the street, that's this guy. And uh, he pulled it off twice, and and then a third attempt, if I, if I remember correctly, that the woman was able to escape. Um, all three victims were quite helpful in this case. We have good evidence in this case. We are now the rest of the day. We know we always hear when things are going well and people that aren't happy typically will let you know that they're not happy. But uh, not not often all the great work just gets missed it and amongst all the other good work. So I just I'm to take, highlight a few instances of uh, Mr. Train is going to work with your agency and uh, the assembly on recognizing the gentleman that helped here. That's my neighbor that tackled this guy down. So it was kind of odd to see a man running past his house with a purse. <laughs> now, if we live in San Francisco, that makes sense. We're right here on the lawn. Well, anyway, thanks. thanks. Thanks so much. Uh, appreciate that, and thanks for the report. Uh, anyone come in from Health and Human Services that I missed? Uh, sir, if you would join us up front, just let us know who you are, and uh, I, I recognize you. Just yeah, hey, Steve Morris, I'm the Deputy Director. So a uh, couple of things you might have been here in time to hear. I was asking Mr. Fitch about the zombie fest thing and you're on the library or not. Do you have any information about that and then also anything from within the department that we need to know about? And I'm, I know I'm specifically interested in the ASP extension that we were working through, uh, some extra funding that was recently approved. I'm not sure I can add much about the zombie fest, but probably have, I'm not that familiar with what's going on. I know that's sort of working with the library to, uh, to get things going. Do you have the date on that, but you You know, I don't know it off the top of my head. Did you get that and send it to us? Yeah, absolutely. Um, as far as the ASP, uh, ASC contract, the State Anchorage Safety Patrol and Safety Center contract, the Assembly appropriated a, another, uh, uh, what was it, um, $189,000. And so we've been looking at the best ways to spend that. And I actually have some something they can share with you. I've uh, got a few copies. But we took a look at the demand for service um, for the Safety Patrol and, and the idea that we wanted to mitigate the impacts on the, on the police department primarily um, so they don't have to make pickups. And what we did is we combined the uh, Anchorage Safety Patrol data with data that we got from the police department to look at demand on an hourly basis to see you know, when the peak, peak periods for service are required. And as you can see, um, it's, you know, it, it makes sense that uh, there's a period uh, from about 6 o'clock in the morning to, I don't have to find it, but, uh, uh, 
to about 1 o'clock in the afternoon where there's very little demand for pickup service. But right now there's no, absolutely no um, ASP service during that period. So all of those pickups are being done by the police department. And so what we did is we looked at a couple, a couple of scenarios, a couple of alternatives to, to, to mitigate the impacts uh, on the police department. And what we've um, come up with is what we call alternative two, which is identified here. Um, and we th think that makes the most sense. Alternative two would involve um, 24 hour service, at least one shift 24 seven. And then we have what we call two power shifts that would cover the period from about two o'clock in the afternoon to six o'clock in the morning when the um, demand for service is the highest. So we'd have a total of five shifts uh, over the course of the day, 24 seven, uh, 365 days a year. That would be the, that would be the service that was provided. We're talking about the van? The van service, right. So so double shifting for 16 hours a day, single shifting for the eight hour period that has <coughs> lower demand. So that, that's kind of the plan. We've talked, we're, we're negotiating uh, the contract amendment with NANA right now, the, con the contractor. And uh, th they have told us that in order to implement this, they're gonna have to purchase two additional vans to, to make this work. So there, there's some capital costs there. One of the issues they have is um, kind of the sustainability of this. There's no guarantee of future funding next year. If they, and they're, they're, they do have some concerns about making a capital purchase for two vans and then finding out that, the, that there's no use for them in the next year. So, so, there's, some, so there's some concern there. Uh, we're estimating, and, and, the, and the numbers are varying. In fact, they're, they're a little bit different than here, that are shown here in this table, maybe slightly lower. But the cost of that, that alternative to the five shifts, the incremental cost uh, for that service is going to be about four hundred twenty thousand dollars a year, roughly. So above and beyond what's already in the contract. And then, as you know, there is uh, the South Central Foundation has been providing about one hundred ninety-nine thousand dollars for the last several years to support um, the, the Nana contract. That's going away in twenty fourteen. So roughly, we're going to see a shortfall of about six hundred thirty thousand dollars a year. So to make this, um, you know, if we were to continue this service as we're hoping to. Mr. Steele had a question for us. Yeah, yeah. Do, uh, do these figures uh, in, uh, include the cost to the APD's budget or the availability and the fire department? We don't, I mean, I, I'm assuming that, that if ASP is picking up folks that APD isn't, it may have some um, beneficial con cost impacts on APD budget. We didn't look at that. This is we're just looking at what the impacts on the, you know, basically on the Nana contract would be. So either they're providing service that was needed, or um, or it's uh, people are being picked up. So that's good. Well, I think they're always picked up. We pick, pick them up. Yeah. We just soak up the extra call. Yeah. Uh, the other the other question is I know that uh, I was down there recently. They had three vans. Are the other two going to be uh, accessed, or are they above mileage? They have three vans. Two of them are, I think, 2011s. They're relatively new. They put a lot of miles on, as you can imagine. Oh, yeah. um, but they have, they have two. I think there's a 2011, and if I'm not mistaken, I think it's a 97 backup van. And what Nan has told us is that is pretty unreliable. They, they will put it in service if one of the other vans has an accident. And, I, you know, it, it, it's amazing. And they, they tend to run into trouble when they run in 24-7. They have accidents. They go out of service. They get beat up by the clients inside. They, they get kicked on and even though they're hardened vans, they they have maintenance requirements and they have to go out of service for sometimes several days at a time and then they need to have backups. And that's why they said, you know, if you want us to even have one shift, a day shift, we're gonna need another van because we just don't have enough um, enough vans to, to support that kind of service. Yeah, two more vans. I think the additional money was was designed for one more van, but if you're you have to buy two Well, no, they'll be in service. I think they. I think that. They, 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 either way, yeah, they, they they'll be in routine. So the new vans will be in routine service. So, but they just wouldn't be want to be running 24 hours a day. They'll be out, out, out one shift or so. The other thing this does is, if I can jump in, is it gives us a cushion for those times when they hit the ratio where they they don't have the right supervision ratio at the center, and so yeah, that what they do have to do is they have to pull the van in off the street and put that person in center, leaving the town without. Well, most of the day here, in the part of the day that's busy, you always got two vans. So probably the worst case scenario is you pull somebody into the center, but you still have a van on the street that can get to the. Work and they're, they're going to reach the passing faster, and therefore. Well, so, so they, they can shift. 
around. That's the limiting factor. Yeah. But as they move people in, move people out, they can transfer between the two functions and keep some level of service operating without just basically saying we're closed, which sometimes happens now. Yeah. And I think in the past, typically they would pull vans off at 1 o'clock or 2 o'clock in the morning, so they would, there would be no service, ASP service from 1 o'clock to 6. And then now, now what we just have that happens, there will at least be one van still on the street. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just for clarification, please. So alternative two is the choice, correct? Mm -hmm. Okay, and so I'm looking at this um, table here on the last page, and um, to, to pay on an annual basis for alternative two is one million dollars. Well, the increment, the increased cost, if you look at the last, last, it's, it's about, it's actually a little bit lower than this. This was an earlier estimate, but it, it's about 430000 additional dollars to implement above and beyond the current contract, which I think is $1.35 million. Oh, okay, so, okay, so yeah. the number here is what the contract cost is right now, and then if we maintain alternative two, it's going to be another $500,000. Well, it's a little bit less than that. But well, yeah, four ninety eight. Yeah. Well, no, I think, I think the number, you've, Nana has come back with some refinements. Okay, it's whatever it less. is. Yeah, okay. but it's roughly four hundred. dollars So 
I've been out twice the first night that it went into effect and then uh, or week before last, I guess. Um, everything seems to be going smooth. I would say that uh, from my perspective and from talking to the, the uh, employees of the two establishments, uh, I think it's fair to say that the, the public has yet figured it out. Uh, there's some using it the first night, not very many people, frankly, just a handful. The second night I was out, I noticed maybe, uh, I'd say maybe 10% of the clients were, were remaining inside. So it's, it's picking up a little bit of speed. Um, everybody seems to think that when it gets colder and more people have figured out the routine that, that we might get uh, more people taking advantage of it. Um, uh, there, are, uh, We've seen no problems associated with the hour yet. Uh, I don't mean to apply that we will. I'm not aware that the patrols take any reports. Uh, we've directed them to um, write reports on any problems that they see and submit them so that we can track, you know, what's working and what's not. Um, and I said I would share those reports with the industry, but I'm not aware that we have any of them yet. Um, the one thing I did notice this last week was, you know, the idea is with more time, there's more cabs can make more runs, and that was one of the objectives. Um, I personally tried to get some intoxicated people that were being a problem into a cab and they were willing to go and the cab drivers were ditching me. Um, and uh, so I'm not sure that the cab, I maybe mean, there's some people hoping the cab is be here, but I'm not sure that every cab driver wants to pick these folks up. So I don't know if there's uh, something else that we need to be working on in that regard in order to make the safety hour work. The, my, my understanding, the reason for the safety hour was to spread bar break out so more people can take advantages of the existing cab fleet. Um, I'm not sure there. Yep. So my question, I guess, to both the industries here is, I guess, for lack of better terms, some media put some way to dis disseminate the information that the safety hour is an option and that the safety hour works because we can get the industries I'm looking around the room of people on faces I recognize that the industry is on both ends who are trying their best to uh, make it work, make it a safer community. Because as we know, problems exist when people that are probably not in their best frame of judgment are congregating together and then it's kind of like the uh, one does something wrong and somebody else might follow along because their judgment is wrong. safety hour the chief has just mentioned that one his presentation and the clerk's office so, so, so. okay uh, well thank you very much and I know Ms. Noack if you can hang for just a minute on we've got an alcohol issue and I know you work on alcohol license and such uh, and chief you may be interested in some of these matters that are on the agenda too so we're going to move into did, did anybody uh, show for fire just want to make sure I don't miss anybody fire okay we'll move on so we have uh, first on the uh, agenda for new business AO uh, 12 
I'm sorry, 13-236, which was uh, item number 14E on last uh, week's last meeting's agenda, and it was the uh, conditional use for alcohol uh, license for the Walmart over at the Creekside subdivision on DeVar and Muldoon. And so we do have some representatives I recognize from Walmart, and if you guys would like to join up at the front, uh, chairs here, whoever wants to represent, and we may have some questions for you as well, so you just grab a few chairs here. And if we could just get your names just so we have it on the record, and then uh, maybe maybe your position. Sure. Hi, my name is Nicole Kaur. I'm an attorney with Patton Boggs, and I'm here representing Walmart in their application for their liquor license today. Okay. My name is Scott Patton. I'm the market manager for Walmart in the state of Alaska. I'm Scott Hoser, the store manager for Muldoon, uh, the bar Walmart. What was your last name? Hoser. Hoser. So at the meeting, we uh, referred your conditional permit uh, approval to this, this committee uh, for some questions and some concerns that were raised, some by members of the public and some by members of the body. So I know that uh, if you may have some, you got a representative I know at the, at the meeting. So if there's uh, anything that you must be able to explain, maybe lay a foundation of what we're looking forward to mitigating some of the concerns. Sure, absolutely. Um, I can, in general, give you kind of a rundown on the policies and procedures that Walmart currently has in place for their alcohol sales. As far as specific concerns, you know, Scott or Scott could answer those for you. Um, in general, you know, Walmart takes its responsibilities as a corporate citizen very seriously. And so they have these policies and procedures worldwide in all their stores um, so that they can have responsible alcohol sales. And examples of that is the training. They have very extensive training of all associates and supervisors for sales of alcohol. They do both an in-house computer-based um, training program, and that is actually done, the associates have to do that on an annual basis. Um, they also um, do a TAM procedure, which complies with the ABC board's uh, liquor license um, applications as well. Um, the associates are tr actually trained on how to turn down or prevent um, alcohol sales to minors and intoxicated persons. And they also are taught and trained how to spot uh, fake IDs. Um, Walmart has a zero tolerance policy of any associate who violates any of its alcohol sales policies and procedures. They are immediately terminated and not eligible for rehire. Um, Walmart also has a policy in Alaska that they ID all. It doesn't matter if you know the age, it's, it's everybody who walks in. Um, they also have a policy that they do not sell alcohol to already intoxicated persons. As I said, they are trained to be able to identify intoxicated persons and to refuse to sell alcohol to these types of people. And unlike their competitors here in town, Walmart also does not sell single servings of alcohol. They do not sell the little shot bottles of um, vodka or anything like that. They don't serve the single beers. Um, unlike their competitors, um, though we have pictures if you'd like to see where other competitors do sell these types of things. Um, I know one of the concerns that was brought up was the Listerine. Um, over the weekend, the Northeast Community Council, who is actually in the Muldoon neighborhood where this new store will be opening, uh, submitted a letter how they talked about they have gone around, they pick up trash there in the community, and they never see the empty Listerine bottles. Their concern in their community are the little single serving of alcohol bottles of vodka and things like that, which Walmart does not sell. You know, one of the things also, too, is Listerine or mouthwash is not an alcoholic beverage. And so there aren't any rules or regulations currently on the books that would restrict Walmart from selling mouthwash or Listerine. Um, but of course, as Walmart does and will continue to do, if and when such a rule or regulation that would restrict all stores from selling mouthwash or Listerine, um, Walmart will fully comply. And really just an overview, Walmart is, has a history in this community of working with this community. Um, we always have representatives at all the community council meetings. We listen to patrons' concerns and we try to address that, you know, whenever possible. And that's what we, you know, we did this here with the Northeast Community Council and we've done that in Eagle River and anywhere else. So if you have any questions, I mean, specific uh, regarding sure, policy. Question or comment, Mr. Okay. Jackson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just want to thank you very much for being here this afternoon. I appreciate your overview. Mm -hmm. And I think I heard you say that Walmart IDs everyone. Yes. Thank you for following the law. <laughs> thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Cole? Uh, yeah, out of curiosity, my part. Where is your listing located at in the store? Is it back on the pharmacy or is it actually available in the liquor store? Uh, it's available in the, the health and beauty department. Yeah, in line with 
you've seen pictures of these like mega bottles, and frankly, I bought a pretty large bottle, maybe twice the size of this one once, and it, the expiration date came and went before I could consume that for my two household family. I can't imagine anything larger than that, but I've seen big jug yeah. bottles. And I'm curious, are, are, do you intend to sell that quantity size in the store? Not that large in our stores. I don't know what the largest, I, I don't have that information available to me on the largest size. Um, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a pretty standard size bottle that's carried uh, in the retail industry. So the largest size is carried by all, the, all of our competitors. I think that really super size one that you're referencing, you might see that in like a Costco or a Sam's Club. We don't carry anything that large. So. Well, uh, one follow-up, looping back on the alcohol uh, packaging store, package store, uh, is that separate entrance from the actual super center itself, or will it be inside, like a kiosk building in the room inside uh, your store? Yeah, the liquor box itself is uh, accessible. It, it's completely enclosed. It's a separate box, uh, but it's only accessible from inside of the building. There's no external entrance to the, the store. It's all the fire code, the, the fire exits and everything that are required, but the only way in or out is through the one control door from the inside of the building. And a follow-up to that is, uh, are there going to be any um, like Super Bowl advertising things and Budweiser or Coors or something, you know, with those big blow-up inflatables, or how are you guys going to advertise your liquor on the <coughs> I mean, is there, are there plans to have, you're the marketing guy, you might know. Yeah, there will, there will be probably point of sale signing inside of the liquor box, but anything outside of the liquor box, no, we won't advertise on the outside of the building, um, even inside of the, the store itself. Any advertising is only inside of the, the liquor box. So if you enter into it, you know you'll you may see some some Super Bowl signing, or um, you know the the vendors may try to bring attention to their product line, but nothing outside of the box at all. Uh, and then looping back on the listerine or the alcohol. Thank you. It might have been you. It could have been both of you. I want to thank you for participating in the Northeast uh, Community Council, St. Foothills Joint uh, Town Square Park venture here this past weekend. Recognized a, a couple of folks who were answering my questions, and a constituent walked up and actually talked about an Ebrid said who wandered into their, their home, uh, and you were able to address one of the concerns again is uh, what I heard, and you might maybe be able to explain the, about listerine or scope. A lot of it doesn't contain alcohol. Some of the Manufacturers are moving away from the alcohol-based mouthwash, and uh, I know that's not something that Walmart mandates the vendors. But is there a move in that area that you're seeing, or would you be willing to? I guess, and I'm, I'm talking citywide here, not just for the moment here. I, I have to say, my bias is I represent that area of town, and I have listened from to constituents of plenty. Um, they are concerned about chronic and injuries, and as you know, even though look, you, you addressed it, even though the alcohol and listerine and listerine isn't, isn't a controlled substance. Uh, I do remember a time when the Walmart in Midtown voluntarily removed some of the large quantities and the high volume numbers mm -hmm. off the shelves directly in an effort to try to stymie some of that and stem you know, to, to add the, the flow that was going on. That's a good question. And I guess just to answer the, the last part of it first before we get too far from that, that's the, the same thought process that we will apply in the Muldoon store as well. You know, we're not going to feature the large quantities of uh, whether it be you know, our in-house brand, Listerine, Scope, anything of that nature, we'll strictly just sell it right off of the side counter and restock it as the rate of sale uh, is necessary. Um, you know, it, it is kind of interesting, the, the, and I, I don't have all the, the, the facts with this, but it, it, it's very apparent that the industry itself is starting to, to change. The actual product line, if you look at our, our side counters in particular, is really starting to grow with uh, uh, lines of mouthwash that are alcohol-free. And, uh, you know, I think that, that seems to be the, the trend of the industry. It's going to be a, probably a slow change. But it, it appears that it seems that the, that, that trend is, is growing. And it would be nice to at some point see that. I, I'd, uh, I'm tempted to, you know, from official positions, perhaps as a committee or even a body uh, on letterhead, uh, if you could help us get the vendor sources, we could maybe make correspondence to them to urge that and would be willing to talk with the offline on whether Walmart or any other vendor the other merchants in town would help us support that move because I think that as a community we need to watch. I, I will just tell you anecdotally a story that's kind of gross. Uh, it's a pretty crappy thing, no pun intended. But these people get sick and they can die from the consumption of this listerine other products, not just the alcohol. It's the listerine or the scope or whatever. I don't watch about it. But uh, yeah, the lady was saying she her stomach was hurting and she had defecated on the sidewalk. And it was, even the guy 
next to her saying, yeah, she just drank too much of that mouthwash to get the alcohol. So chasing it down. So it is a problem in our community, and I'm sure it's not just Anchorage that's seeing this problem. So encouraged by the information. Any questions or comments? Good talk. Uh, <clears throat> actually, a comment. I, I really appreciate your being here today and hearing what uh, you've got to say. But, you know, uh, just a heads up. Um, I've encountered in these two of my community councils recently uh, expressed concerns about Walmart uh, being an issue for them. Uh, <clears throat> I think it's important that you do some outreach, uh, maybe go to some of those community councils, uh, ask to keep it on the agenda, to be there to answer questions and concerns. And, uh, you know, I, I've always considered you to be a good corporate citizen in this community, and uh, I encourage you to continue to maintain that reputation, but be aware that, uh, you know, your name's turning up, and that's part of the reason why you're here today, is it's been called to our attention. So, um, uh, a little bit of prevention goes a long way. Absolutely. We appreciate the, the feedback. If there's Thanks. any of them that, you know, we're not participating in, if somebody would just, you know, let me know. I know my store managers would love to participate, and uh, we'll be more than happy to make sure that we, we carve out the time and schedule it uh, for us to be there. Uh, so we have from the administration, Mr. McLaughlin from uh, planning, is uh, any questions of Mr. McLaughlin, I'll ask you specifically is, are there any issues uh, the planning department has seen on conditional use of applications? Thanks for the question. No, there's not. And so that everything met the requirements set before the planning department? Yes. Mr. Steele? Yeah, uh, mine is, uh, again, with Walmart in terms of, is there a difference in price, uh, either higher or lower, generally speaking, between mouthwash? The, the prices of the, the mouthwash right now um, without alcohol is, is a little more expensive. And I would imagine, you know, if the industry shifts that way, I think over the course of time, it's really about supply and demand. So it's kind of how that, you know, the pricing structure seems to work with those problems. And there's no, uh, is there anything from the clerk's office reference to this application? And then a question for the applicant. I know that I was approached by this different time. You're set to open for business when? September 25th. Which is the day after next meeting. Does this body have, uh, this committee have any concerns that we shouldn't be making recommendations for that time? If not, if it's okay with you, Mr. Chairman, I'll uh, submit an email from the committee. Is there anybody here that would like to speak for a few moments on the Walmart liquor license or the issue about Walmart liquor? Yeah. Mr. McGrath? Hi, my name is Tom McGrath. I'm with this. Uh, was the person who testified at the assembly meeting, and I've uh, been a member of the Spartan Community Council for about 30 years. And a lot of the issues that we have are around alcohol. And we recently had in and out liquors before the ABC board, and since then they've just done an awful lot of work to clean up the area. Uh, just talked to Dan Coffey a few minutes ago, and he mentioned the same thing that I've heard from Lieutenant Gillum, that lots of times when they pick up alcohol containers in, in the Midtown area, it's Walmart. The, the receipt in the bag is Walmart. We went to Walmart and I took pictures, and you have a huge area that's Monarch vodka. Monarch is the cheapest stuff, and that's the alcohol of choice among the street and ebriates. And, uh, you know, it just gets frustrating to pick up and see so many containers in our area coming from Walmart, and Walmart does a huge volume compared to, say, Mom and Pop. And, uh, you know, pushing that into our area is to my way of thinking not being a good corporate citizen. It's being somebody who's just making money off the, the, the area. So, uh, uh, you know, and you do have in your liquor store probably more space allocated to Monarch, out, Monarch Vodka than any other single item. And um, I would just ask that you limit it. And people talk about shooters. The street and neighborhoods don't buy shooters, or very little, because they're very expensive, and, you know, ounce for ounce. So, uh, 
it's the Monarch Arctic that we see the most, and that's also a string of mouthwash containers. And I pick up trash. My wife's been bitching at me for years. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, uh, and uh, Renee at the Blaine's uh, is one that uh, probably gets the brunt of the activity uh, in, in and around the uh, DMV because they use the restroom facilities at the DMV. And, uh, Young people do pick up the containers. They do look in the bags. They see where the receipts come from. And Walmart is surfacing more and more often. So, and I would love to see you come to the Smart Community Council meeting. Okay, thank you. Mark, did you have something you wanted to add? Yeah. As an East Anchorage resident, I'll also be testifying on something else later. I will tell you, as somebody who's walked, 12th and Muldoon. As you know, Mr. Honeman, you know we have what's called the problem child called 12th and Muldoon. Right to the south of you is Fred Meyer. Okay? They sell alcohol too. And I, in fact, I just tagged you in a Facebook post about an alcohol bottle three weeks ago when I was walking to do something. And there was this inebriant on the cross side over there. And they also, there's a homeless camp way over there on the south part there, right before the creek, next to the park that everybody in the Northeast Community Council wants to have as a park instead of a private business. So, therefore, you guys as a, as a Walmart, we do. However, let's make it a non-alcohol Walmart store. Period. No alcohol. And maybe Fred Meyer will get the message and not have any alcohol there either. As well. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Appreciate it. All right. Anything uh, we we do? I guess I am concerned about the Monarch. Is it their attempt to sell Monarch vodka uh, in any quantities? Of it's currently a, a part of the, the item selection. Yeah, yeah. I, we can go back and we can take a look at the actual. Um, I, I don't. I don't know what the, the number of facings are allocated in, in this particular store. So um, something to look at. I would think yeah. that uh, you know. I, I, I think I kind of tend to agree that maybe perhaps what I see as the cycle of some of the chronic is they get as much money as they can from the little cardboard signs, and then they true one of them that's probably the least integrated that's most sober will walk into a store and they'll buy a large phone to go back and share the jug, so to speak. So the little shooters probably will defeat that. But, uh, so I, I would think that's something that you might want to look at. Um, at this point, I would highly encourage you to work with the community uh, trying to work in mitigating those compounding of the problems mm -hmm. that we've seen, been seeing. Uh, and it's a community issue. It's not just in my area, Tom. But as you know, Northeast Community Council did not oppose, I uh, remind my colleagues, did not oppose this license or this uh, license and uh, they usually are very vocal and not shy about talking. So, thank you very much. Thank you. So the next item we have is the uh, alarm, safety alarm registration. Uh, Mrs. Judith Andrew, is, are you here? Okay. You'd like to do the table there if you would. <coughs> It'd be just, I, I, I think I have it right, A-N-D-E-R-E-G-G, -G, is that correct? That's correct. And, sir? and my name is David Pelto. I'm a Okay, very good. Could you just let us know what your concern is? Uh, and we, we try to get brief so we can... Okay. We'll, we'll try to make it brief. Summer of 2011, we moved to Anchorage. We put a security system on our house because we travel a fair amount. Um, that winter, we had a false alarm, which we were horrified and it had was not, it was an equipment failure problem. We worked extensively with our security company to clear it up. We did have a false call out. This summer, in July, we got a, you are overdue and owe an arm, unarmed registration fee. Um, and it was, it felt threatening. It was the first we ever even knew there was an alarm registration system fee. Uh, we've had the system for over two years. We get an overdue late notice that threatens us with a, a penalty for not having insured it or registering it before. But we 
went ahead and sent our $25 in immediately. And then we called, and we've had several conversations with the police department, with the ombudsman, and with our assembly people about it. We don't object to the fee itself. We think that that's, if that's the way you help recoup the, the, the cost of monitoring those kinds of systems, that's fine. But we objected to the tone of the letter. And when we talked to, I believe it was Lieutenant Phelan, I'm not sure, and Julie Sapp, they admitted that maybe they needed a different kind of letter when they were notifying somebody for the first time. It shouldn't be quite so threatening. It should just be, are you aware that there is? The second thing that we were concerned about was that the form that the police department uses says that, an o it's, and it's based on 840.030, the form says an owner is under a continuing obligation to keep the information on his registration current by reporting any change to the chief of police within 10 days. Now on their registration form there is a list of emergency contact people. And we asked if we had to keep that current because we change our emergency contact person fairly regularly so that we don't wear out our neighbors. And they said, well, that's not what it means. And I said, that's what it says. And they said, well, you have to talk to the assembly because they're the ones that would need to change that. And I said, well, you could leave emergency contact people off your registration form. You don't really need our emergency contact people. All you need to know is that we have a security company and you call them. So this second thing that we wanted to do was either get the form changed so that the emergency contacts aren't on it, or suggest a one-word change for you all that adds the word ownership information. And not all information has to be changed so that they're not worried about our contacts. That's the second item. The third item, sure, sure, sure. And I would have brought more copies, but I wasn't sure how many. And it's, it's a really simple one word change that if the assembly makes it and just says, we want ownership information changed, that leaves emergency contacts off the list. I don't want to give the names of my neighbors to the police department, nor do I want to be calling the chief of police every time I travel to give him another name, because this tells me that I have to do that, is the way I read it. The third question that we have about this whole thing is that we don't object to paying the $25 a fee if the money goes back to the police department or whomever, whoever runs the program. But as far as we can tell, they, aren't, they don't really have a contact list of all the people who have security <coughs> systems. They've contacted the security companies, and the security companies don't want to get a list of all the people that are their clients to the police. So the police told us that they were thinking about doing a PSA to notify people that there was this alarm registration fee, but so far as I can tell, that hasn't happened. And so the only people that pay the $25 a year fee are those of us that have had false alarms. And that means that I'm going to be paying $25 a year from now until whenever we don't have a security system, along with anybody else who's had a false alarm system. But that there is not an overall system in place for contacting everybody. And I was going to suggest either you put it on a utility bill or the property tax statements that go out to owners, but it seems to me that if I'm paying my $25 a year for my system, that everybody who's got a system should have to pay it, not just those of us who have false alarms. Yeah, and frankly, uh, the, the whole issue there was uh, when the false alarm occurred that was no fault of our own, we did not do something ourselves. It was a, a system failure on the part of the, the company's equipment that initiated the alarm. And uh, so we figured out a way to, with more cost to ourselves, make sure that there would never be a false alarm that went to the police again. Uh, and what we do is we pay extra to have the security company come and take a look if, if there's uh, uh, an alarm before the police would ever be called. And that's a cost to us. But as a result of that uh, false alarm, now we've been identified as somebody who has a security company and a, an alarm system, and now we have to pay $25. No one else is being identified that. Uh, in any other way beyond the fact that people who have been identified with these <coughs> false alarms. And so, uh, at the very least, we want to hear that the assembly is going to do something to <laughs> initiate uh, a means by which uh, other people who have the, these alarm systems will also have to pay uh, the registration. Uh, that just seems only fair. Uh, and it 
seems ridiculous that the police is re <laughs> reduced to only getting this $25 by way of the fact that some people have had false alarms over the last five years or however far back they went to, to find this. You know, we lived in the valley for 30 years and we moved to town uh, by choice. And uh, I like living in town, but it is interesting. I kind of understand why my neighbors laugh at me sometimes for moving to town because of these sorts of things. Thank you. Appreciate it. Uh, we have Mr. Training. And Mr. Jackson, a question for you. When you guys had that alarm system installed, did the company tell you that you had a $25 yearly pay to the city? No. No, and we have talked to them extensively about this, and what we were told by our security company, which we've also been told by the, the police department, told us that our security company was one of the ones that wasn't coming forth with a list of their clients, and that they did not feel like our security company was being very helpful. When we called our security company about the whole thing, they said the, this particular fee went into place, I think, the fall after we'd been installed. And they said they were now telling new people. And I said, well, why didn't you go back and tell the rest of us that have systems? They didn't have an answer to that. But, but the city is not, I mean, as far as I can tell, the, the city is not doing anything to identify people. They were going to do a PSA with what the police department told me. But somehow that had fallen through the cracks. And that's the part we don't understand. Thanks, Judith. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, first Let of all, what you think. <laughs> I'll start off by saying that this is the first I've heard about any of this. Um, and I've been working hard on the false alarm deal, so let me uh, wing it. As far as the wording on the letters, uh, we can take a look at that um, if we're being. from the lieutenant about that. I, That's really not an issue anymore, as far as I'm concerned. I think that there's somebody wants to try to resolve that. They did uh, talk to us about that. We, if we can, you might be able to take that offline. If I can just have the chief respond real quick, we have some questions. So uh, as far as the, the emergency contact information, I'll look, go back and look at the, the ordinance in these forms and talk to the people that touch this every day. I think the notion was that if we couldn't, con not everybody has a security company. Some people have homegrown alarm systems and there isn't a guardian security or something <coughs> in between. So what we want to know is, this thing is blasting in the neighborhood. Some of these are audible and nobody can sleep. Who can we call that can come over here and shut the thing down? That's the, the information that we're trying to get at. Now, if there's a better way for us to get at it, or if we don't need it in the cases where there's an alarm company that can intervene, you know, maybe we can tweak that and make it better. And I will try and do what I can. And maybe there's room for me to do it without changing the ordinance. If an ordinance change is required, I can come back and talk to you guys about that. PSAs, um, it's a good idea. I didn't realize that the word wasn't getting out. Um, I've got a brand new communications director, and we are implementing um, video uh, technology. I mean, we're opening our own newsroom, essentially, and we're going to be producing our own video content. That on the list of things to do. The practical reality is, though, probably if the alarm companies aren't cooperating, if they're not telling us who their client list is, we would have no way of knowing until we show up there. And to that end, we're putting little yellow hangers on the doorknobs when we do go to your false alarm saying, hey, did you know? Here's what will happen if you have too many false alarms. Here's how, here's what you got to register for. And the only reason we put the registration in the new um, uh, ordinance was so we have something to revoke for the people who don't do what you're doing who go on to do five or six um, seven false alarms. I'll tell you since this alarm ordinance went into effect in 20 uh, hang on a second here. it went into effect mid, mid 2011 in uh, years 2008 through 2011 we have about 6,000 false alarms annually every single year 6,000 um, those are false those are calls where nothing happens okay and we're sending call takers to take them those dispatchers to dispatch them cops are going there they're rattling doors 6,000 times a year for four years in a row in 2012 that after the ordinance passed that number dropped to 4,000 
4,000. We're on track to have it down to 3,200 by the end of this year. We track the, the repeat offenders. The, if you look at five-time offenders, we had 200 frequent flyers a year in 2008, 2009, 2010, 2011. If you guys passed the ordinance that we asked for, that number dropped in 2012 to 84, and we're on track to come in at 52 this year. So the ordinance is working. It's doing what it's intended to do, and that is to have people take care of their alarm systems, work with your alarm company, get your systems adjusted, learn how to put in the code, do all the things that you described that you've done, but you're a rarity. I'm glad I'm, I've met you. I have not met anybody like you. Um, it, it, historically in this town, it's cheaper to blow it off and just pay your fine because the fines are cheap and the cops are just going to come. And we can't afford it anymore, folks. Our staffing is going down, down, down. And this is real work that builds complacency amongst the officers going to false alarm after false alarm after false alarm after false alarm. And then once it's a good alarm and, you know, you're not on your toes. And look at all the people who can get us to come to their calls because we're busy going to alarm calls that are no good. They never were good. we got to fix this. When you guys heard from the ICP in 1996, when they were studying us, they told you at the work session that their the false alarm thing needed to be fixed, that the, that the false alarm, it's not unusual in lower 48 to have $700 fine for a false alarm. We were at, what then, $25? <laughs> you know, it's it's crazy. We're, the, we're way out of whack with the rest of the country. And so I hope we don't water down the ordinance. I will work with you on these suggestions you made here. And if we can improve our service that we are providing, admittedly, it's a tougher service now, but we will try and smooth it out and learn as we go. It is a new ordinance and it's new for us as well as for the community. And I do know the owner of this company, and I, he's a nice guy. I don't know why we should. Is it okay? Just one last thing. Look at the ordinance and see if we have any requirements for the company to make sure they notify their customers. I can't remember if it says that or not. I'll look at it. We may have to have a form created where the company signs off and the individual signs off that they met, they've been told as is being installed. I just don't want the customers to have it installed and never being told by the company all the way through. Well, you know, every telephone company that wants to do business here has to submit their client list to us for 911 reasons. I don't see any reason why we couldn't require alarm companies. So I'm willing to help you with the chief. So when you take a look at the old ordinance we passed, just let me know what you know. I think that, I think one of the sticking points is some of these alarm companies do not ex they're not local. These are call centers in other states and maybe even other countries, and we have no way to reach out and. Did we put in the ordinance they had to have a, a local representative, though? We might have. We did. We did. We did. We did. Right. i got to look at what it is we actually did. You might have required that. It seems like it's right for you. Ms. Bridget. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Judith and David are training my constituents, and we've been back and forth for probably a month or more with emails, and so that's why I invited them to come to the public safety committee meeting. I'm glad they're here, because I need you to be here, and you can address their concerns, and frankly, I've never met anybody like them either. And I mean that in a positive way, because they're really concerned about the community. Um, but the one thing that Chief, if, if you can address, they mentioned charging everybody $25, and the way I operate is doing what's best for this entire community. So I'd like some feedback from you. You can either do it now or maybe later on, on that whole concept. The concept was, I, the ordinance says that after a certain point, we can revoke their license, in which case we just don't go anymore. They, we can't have them pull the thing out, but we just put it on the list and we don't go to that one. And that was supposed to be another uh, potential uh, uh, consequence out there that would force the alarm companies and the owners to deal with whatever problem is causing them to feed alarms. Right, right. And we copied this from Lincoln, Nebraska, and we have data from Lincoln that shows the drastic reduction in calls that they experience. Not something we just thought up on Friday night after a beer. Um, I mean, there's. But I understand that. I'm just talking about their suggestion of charging everybody $25, which I'm really not at all clear on anyway. But um, can you 
kind of clarify that a bit, and then maybe you can respond to that real briefly, <coughs> briefly please? Uh, us? Well, David mentioned it, yeah, charging right. everybody $25. Well, well, it's fine with us. No, but Elby doesn't understand what it is. We got a letter that said there's a $25 annual registration fee right. for an alarm system. Right. But it's not clear to us that everybody's got a, in fact, it's very clear to us that a lot of people have security systems that aren't getting the $25 fee charge because the city hasn't figured out how to find those people. I At least that's what the police that. department intimate, and that's a part of our objection, is that we feel like we're being charged something that not everybody's got a security system that's paying. And, and believe me, I'm absolutely in support of the police, and I want you to get every dollar. <laughs> that's that's part, part of our argument, is that I want the assembly to help you to make sure that everybody, if, if we're going to have an ordinance, let's make sure everybody is living up to the ordinance, not just the few who happen to have, in our case, a, uh, a false alarm. And I've been a public participation officer, and PSAs are, lo are lovely, but a lot of people don't pay any attention to them, and maybe they don't pay attention to property tax statements either, but it seems to me that there's got to be more than one way to let everybody know that they're out there. And we had actually thought about the fact that, yeah, the security company should be told, if you're going to do business in this town, you must tell people that this is what they owe. In fact, maybe they should pay it and charge it back to us as a part of our monthly, of our annual yeah. fees. We just don't think it's clear. That's our, our whole thing. Very good. So offline, and are you okay with them, him having your him contact info on that? Absolutely. Yeah. Chief, if you could follow up with that, let us know how we could help. Great. Uh, yeah, I will. Uh, I will share quickly. Hopefully, uh, we had the perfect storm in my home last week. Uh, made a mad dash out of the door to go pick up a, a prescription at the pharmacy. Set the alarm off. I left my cell phone at home, but with the assistant that I've got, uh, my alarm goes directly to the company. The company calls me to verify if it's a false alarm or not before they ever call the police. The police then dispatch and come out and. Uh, by the time I got home, I was having the alarms, <laughs> the alarms going off, and I, I go grab my cell phone, and sure enough, here I've had the calls. They've uh, called and dispatched the police officer. I immediately get a call back to them, but uh, while I was chatting to them, it was a police officer checking my back door. Uh, so I do pay the fee. Everybody with an alarm system is supposed to pay it, uh, and I'm telling you, I as embarrassed as I was by the fact that in reality, ours wasn't a false one. We literally set it off and it left home. Uh, but the response was phenomenal. Somebody was there in eight minutes. Uh, I don't have any remorse at all about paying a fee. And I'm appreciative of the fact that I'm part of a system that works the way it does. Because when my alarm goes off, they immediately call me to validate before they call the police to dispatch. So there's good, there's good providers out there in good systems. Thank you. Good. That's quick, Chief. Um, I am uh, I'm one of those good citizens who sent in the $25. I, uh, I just had an alarm system put in. Uh, my provider gave me the form, told me I need to do that. The question is, what happens after a year? Do I get a bill? I mean, or do, uh, or do I get a nasty letter? Or what do I get uh, when, uh, when my annual is due? Is that something I have to track? Uh, I don't know. So if you, could, if you could let us know, you know, the process, keep it the process and what we might need to do. If it's ordinance related based, then let us know if it's not. Yeah, I just might forget when, uh, when it was expired. I had thought about that. I had thought about, okay, now next summer, do I need to call the police so I don't get that letter so I can send my $25 in, or do they actually have a mailing system? I don't know. I know Julie knows the answer to this question. I don't. I'll, I'll look into it. And Mr. Hess, the ombudsman is here, and he raised his hand, so I'm going to stop. Thank you, Mr. Hahnemann. Um, I just wanted to comment. Uh, Barbara Jones, the previous ombudsman, worked with Chief Mew to develop the door hanger he was speaking of. And there were a lot of complaints from citizens that APD would respond to a false alarm at their home. And how did they know APD was there? They didn't know they were, had been there until the next time they had a false alarm and then they were hit with a $25 charge. So the false, having that door hanger has greatly reduced uh, complaints with our office for, for, from citizens saying they weren't aware that they even had a false alarm. So now APD does not make contact with a citizen when they respond to that false alarm, they place a door hanger on the door. Um, this is like, the, this, this whole scenario is kind of a, the, the chicken before the egg. Uh, 
you look at the code, it says it is the responsibility of citizens to register their alarms. So if the alarm companies are not informing citizens, how do citizens know that they're supposed to register? You can't find it. UK. It's not readily available online. I think there, you can go to APD's website, and if you get down into the website, there is a link, but it's, it's not readily available. You can do uh, some inserts and utility bills, and you know people are going to miss those. So uh, Ms. Tucker and I are, are meeting to talk about a few issues tomorrow. One of the issues is uh, looking at the ordinance and trying to figure out if there's a, something we can put in the ordinance that would solve this problem. That, that, you know, how can we address it? Can we, we maybe we could have the alarm companies collect the fee and and register the alarms for the citizens and submit the money to the municipality. Maybe we can require that they provide be provided to give a form to citizens when they install alarms. We just have to look at what the parameters are. I talked briefly with Mr. Trainee about it a week or so ago, and so I'm going to meet with Julia tomorrow, and that's one of the items I'm going to talk about. Well, I am concerned about uh, companies charging 35 to give 25 to the city. I mean, they, they may bump it up, and then I mean, they're, they're in business to make money, so I'm concerned about that. Right, we just see, we see what works best for citizens. But I think the ombudsman would be a perfect place to do the PSAs and make sure people in the community are aware of them. So, yeah. I, I, whatever you do uh, in order to streamline this and make it so that uh, uh, there's more participation in terms of the payments, I, ha I don't. I would like to see the least amount of paperwork that the police should have to deal with. Um, I, you know, I, I, uh, I, I'm taking up the chief's time with this one. Is I, I'm embarrassed. <laughs> It's an issue that we need to address, yeah. and we thank you for bringing it yeah. to us. So, well, you know, the devil's all in the details. We get these ideas, we, we put out, you know, sure. we understand the broad strategic direction, the broad policy, and then the worker bees get down there, and then they implement <coughs> stuff. And they don't necessarily know where we're going, and you know, sure. we just got to get better. And it, it's brand new; it's about a year and a half old, and it may take us a couple bites at the apple before we get it all worked yeah. out. Miss Gray Jackson, thank you, Mr. Chairman. But anyway, don't be embarrassed. Part of the public process, okay? No. Yeah. But, but yeah, so don't be embarrassed. But we do have to move on because we got a really yeah. big topic to talk about. Not that yours wasn't, but yeah. it's just no. me in here. Miss <laughs> uh, Lane, are you here? Yes. Ms. Lane, okay. Ma'am, is it possible? Can I can I ask you to set for a big patient? I, I can't remember if you were here early on or not. We have a big topic to go over. Or right, right. Yeah. How, how long do you think it takes? I can wait for that. Are you sure? So, uh, okay, very good. We'd like to uh, move to the taxi cab uh, ordinance, and I know that uh, Mr. Traney has done a lot of work. Mr. Muster's here, uh, and so I'd like to uh, present the. Uh, Mr. Traney, would you please do the honor of presenting your? No problem. This is a draft ordinance relative to taxi cabs. Now we've got a work session on Friday, two hour work session. I'm going to be able to present this to Ernie on the 24th as chairman of the assembly to set up for a public hearing. Now this is the draft, and we'll probably have an initial version as we get to the 24th. As you go through this, if you look on page two, we have first definition. What we're talking about, the definitions are there at the beginning, so there's no question this is what we're talking about. We define fuel efficient vehicles. These people are going to know what are those. It's defined here. Moving on down, on page three of 66, it's big. We have the Transportation Commission. We're not getting rid of it. There was one version of that. I think uh, Osiander had that when she was on the assembly. They got rid of the Transportation Commission. This one does get rid of it. It expands it to seven people because we want at least two, two on there that are well versed in transportation, specialized in this. On page five of 66, we've got Transportation Commission rates, how they set them. On page 6 of 66, we've got Transportation Commission, if you've got a complaint about it, this is how to file your complaints for civil and criminal citation. Then we drop down at the bottom to hearing officer. Is any complaints coming out of the Transportation Commission would end up going to hearing officer? If not resolved, great. If not resolved. And then on 7 of 66, 
we've got the powers and duties of the transportation inspector. So this is all the things that Eric Musser, whoever he places him when that happens, if it ever does, their responsibilities. They're listed in here. Now on seven, um, eight of 66, we've got vehicle inspections, mechanical equipment standards, maximum reporting. Next couple of pages, you've got all that broken down. Now on 11 of 66, we've got drug and alcohol testing. Because people are always concerned about drug and alcohol use. We've got the testing requirements down listed. On 12 and 66, we've got enforcement authority at the bottom, 11.10.090. And then on page 13, we've got uh, hearing appeals. If you think that you, your case wasn't handled correctly, here's the appeal process. Now on page uh, 16 of 66 at the top, we've got denial of suspension replication of licenses or permits. Out of uh, curiosity, I, I know there's a lot of meat here. Uh, is there any changes to the persons who are suspected of or charged but yet not convicted? Oh, yeah. Okay, no, We're right. getting there. Now, on page uh, 2466, we've got penalties and remedies. Some of the penalties and remedies for dealing with uh, tax cab industry problems we've got with it. Now on page 30 of 66, under 11.10.185, we've got surveillance system required for regulated vehicles. Every regulated vehicle shall be equipped at all times with a video camera surveillance system and have global GPS capability. That's to get rid of he said, he said, she said, or she said, he said, or he said, he said, or she said, she said, depending on not driving. Nonetheless, a video camera's been extremely useful and the police realm. It'll work well for all of our cabs, so no question as to who said what when or who did what when. My question is, who, who's going to maintain the database for the video? Well, uh, Mr. Well, thank you, Mr. Long. Actually, uh, there's no maintenance of the data except to automatically overwrite in 72 hours in continuous loop increments unless requested for whatever works by a police officer or us to look at something. Okay, so who, who's going to be responsible for collecting and having a data uh, collection of that, of those that are requested? Well, that would be either uh, a, a, the police department or our office uh, to an investigation. There's no other data retention. Like, if you had a case where there's someone suspected of a sex crime in a cab, uh, allegations that driver made a pass or grabbed or something, um, and there's video available from the cab, who's going to maintain that database? Because there's originally, there's the original, and then there's the copy that you must maintain. Well, I think what we do is we probably seize a copy of the clip that is an evidentiary reason. We extract that and keep it on the disk and property evidence or something like that. Okay. And then we'd ask him to, it's probably, I imagine the technology exists for him to block that clip so it won't overwrite it, so the original is always there on the hard drive. And that's the way most of the systems work. Our disk isn't good enough for court. We go back and extract the original. That's the question. I know that some of the attorneys in the room can help me on the best evidence. Yeah. Well, we have. That's exactly going to take you, Mr. Zimmerman. What we've done right now, if we've had a reported incident or something, we're looking into. We go to the operator, the you know, the, the, the vehicle owner, the owner, owner, and we request that data or the chip you know, for that applicable period, and then we have the software on our computers. To so this one. Sorry, don't let me, let me get bogged down. Sorry. <coughs> um, page 38 of 68, we got uh, taxi cab vehicle markings. Require all taxi cabs to be adequately marked and to show if they're handicapped accessible. Markings should be on them too. On 45 of 66, we've got vehicles for our vehicle markings. And there's a statement in there the video surveillance regarding recording is in progress, should be in the taxi cab so everybody knows they're being recorded. <coughs> Sometimes that helps to clean up behavior. <laughs> and you know you're being recorded. It's worked with our school district with the bus. <coughs> now on page 47 to 66, we've got, if you look on 13.30.020, chauffeur's licenses, we're going to require under B, including a national criminal records check. 
not just in Alaska, but nationwide. We want to make sure there's not a problem that happened in some part of Louisiana that we should know about. We don't know about it. Where, where is it nationwide? Page 47. 47 is the question I have because something appeared in Debbie's version and I didn't know if it was still in this or not. Who's going to do those? Uh, thank you. Uh, what's going to happen is uh, as we're going through the model just like the school districts where they'll go over to uh, one of the private companies that have their fingerprints done and the application filled out. It's all submitted by that, you know, that company with the results coming to us. I think it's at least one way to keep the problems that happen outside from bringing up to us. That's the only way to do it. The only way, on page 4966, we've got duty to serve the public. It lists the requirements <coughs> that the chauffeur must serve the public, the hours they have to serve. Will this address the concern we had about the uh, downtown? I just need that, you know, like we commented, uh, they extended the safety hour, but the cabs are refusing to take receipts from that generally. Does this, does this address that? Go ahead, Eric. Uh, uh, thank you, Mr. Wolf. Well, uh, <coughs> actually, an existing code, and we'll maintain it here as a driver, uh, uh, driver is, is really not allowed to refuse service. And especially when an officer is trying to put somebody in a cab and send them home, that they certainly should be accommodated. Now they're subject to citation, and we could if we actually go to force taking action against the permit. Okay. What I was going to try and do is build this here the budget. Two full-time inspectors. Thank you. We're trying to build that in the budget. Right. Yeah, we can't dedicate funds, but we can. My well, legislative intent is we're doing the budget. Because he's the only guy right now, one part-time inspector, and himself. And you can't do that. We need two full-time inspectors. <coughs> in the interest of full disclosure, I should tell you that I was in plain clothes, so the cab driver might not have known it was the police department trying to that. But you don't matter. But it shouldn't matter. Yeah. If someone's hailing a cab for service correct I'm not wrong, they, they should be picking up the fare, correct? Sir? And that's an existing code, correct? Right? Now on, uh, on page uh, 50 of 66, item F, a chauffeur may not ask, allow, or permit a passenger to sit or ride in the front passenger seat unless all seating per rule of the driver's seat is full. This is because of an incident we had here in town, and I talked to a grandparent, and being a grandparent, I'm a little sympathetic with him. His granddaughter was directed by the taxi cab operator to sit in the front seat and pulled off the street and tried to attack her. So I want them separated from the drivers. It's uh, 50 of 66, right there, this one. Okay, so unless, if my name is Chairman, unless the passenger specifically requests Quest, yes. Yeah. And in, in this case, the plane did not request to sit. No, no, I only mentioned it because uh, I know. one of our constituents had a concern. And then on 51 of 66, uh, item 11.30.090, chauffeur use of electronic device to communicate by text while driving is set forth in AS. It's prohibited by this code. The exception is the state statute where equipment regarding services display vehicle dispatching information. They can't be on the phone while they're driving. Now, if they're stopped and there's no forward move of the vehicle, they can be on the phone the way any of us can. But as they're taking a client, they can't be on the phone. We may get some flap on the back. So. So just so you know, to clarify, it's showing communicate by text, but not necessarily by conversation. They can also talk to people if they're not forward with them. Yeah. Now, if you look on page, uh, uh, page 56 of 66, where it says dispatch service operation duty to serve the public. You had a question on the duty to serve the public. It's lined out here. They've got a responsibility to serve the public. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Training, can we go back to page 51 where we talked about um, communicate by text? Yep. This, this says communicate by text. It doesn't say that they can't be on the uh, cell phone. Yeah. Yeah. I know what I want. Okay. What, are, Thank what you. are the thoughts of the industry, Mr. Coffey, would you take that under concern consideration? Talking versus texting? No, no talking on the phone. Statute were uh, applicable. Could 
service displaying vehicle dispatching information to passenger transport that's talking to the server. Like I said, if you go back to 56 or 66, we got dispatch service operation duty to serve the public. And if you look at Gene on the next page, request, uh, when a request was for wheelchair accessible service or dispatch to disabled community access, it goes through their dealing with the disabled community on the responsibilities that come up. That's something we've heard many of the disabled people think about. So what you need to do is just take a look at this, and we've got a work session on Friday for a couple of hours, and then I'm going to give it to the chairman on the 24th, and I think we'll probably set a work session up after that for the actual same members once they get a chance to read it. You may have another One comment I had a concern um, was a concern. She said often she'll get in a taxi cab and the driver's not wearing a seatbelt. And I know that it's a lot that you wear a seatbelt, but she doesn't she won't get in a cab and the driver's not wearing a seatbelt. How do we address that issue? I mean, is there any way to address it? It, it may already seem, in the law. Well I know, I know, but um, and, and I'm just bringing it up because I was asked to by my constituent. Eric. Thank you. Um, thanks, Elvie. That's okay. That sort of comes down to an enforcement issue. We were out Saturday night, and that's probably 50% of the drivers didn't have a seat on them. Uh, nor did the passengers when we tell them when the passengers in the car. Um, they can be, that there is a part of existing Title 11 that we can cite them for under their uh, needing to operate in a safe, professional manner. Um, you know, we warn them. Number two, he very much liked the fact that licensees 
uh, drivers and permittees and dispatch were all responsible for uh, the failure to respond to a taxi cab, I mean to a handicap call, because they get a permit, as you all know, for roughly half of what a full-on permit goes for, so uh, they have a responsibility to do that, and now there's an enforcement mechanism and record-keeping requirements at um, the dispatch company. So you can determine if some guy with a handicapped cab permit is turning down handicap rights to take uh, those that are not. Uh, so there's, a, there's an enforcement mechanism. And um, the other complaint, which I don't believe is warranted yet, but I told him I'd pass it on, is he says that at least 10% of the fleet should be handicapped accessible, and I said they just doubled the number of handicap permits recently, uh, and I think it's probably something that needs to be looked at over time, but we do have anchor rides in addition to taxi cab permits, and the commission, of course, as you know, convenience and necessity, they can look at it next year or the year after, whatever, and, make, and see if the 11 permits that are now out there for handicap serve the public. The last thing, and I didn't, I didn't realize that the chief was going to leave, but my understanding is that the chief and, uh, and the city manager were on the downtown streets at bar break, and the report I received back was that there were an adequate or more than adequate number of cabs available uh, at the time. Uh, so I don't know how that is working out, but I do know there's things about loading zones and cabs parking in them and trying to make it easier in the downtown area, uh, particularly at the bar break time, to be you know, in close proximity to where people are coming out. So, um, on that subject, just a moment, if Mr. Musser, are you aware Mr. Michaelis is supposed to be working with transportation and uh, traffic engineer on posting? Have you, in your inspection, have you, has anybody noticed? I've been working on that with the traffic engineer. Yes, I well, we should, have, we should have a resolution by the 24th. So we haven't posted them downtown yet? No. What they're telling me is that every place is marked as a loading zone doubles as a taxi cab zone at the night. But I, I need to have that written down in here so the taxi cab owners will know they can pull into there. The, the, this is, I, not to get a sidetrack, but it's frustrating because we've had this, this was a commitment made last year, or we were hoping to have an experiment mm -hmm. the tail end of the summer, about this time you came at the same time, should have had a whole year now of uh, data. To be able well, it was to brought say. up again in what? June or something of yeah. this year at that big meeting with downtown yes, community yes, counter or and partnership. We've had the municipal manager on committed that he would have this done. And yeah. I, and this well, I, it, I'm it, not it, trying to throw anyone in the bus. I'm just tell you emails that I've had between the transportation, between the traffic engineer and Dean, our attorney. Yeah. We're going to get this thing resolved. We want it in black and white, one in writing, so the taxi cab operators, drivers know where they can park. Because I want to sit driving around for hours. Mr. Chairman, I just, no, nothing further, but I did want to thank Julia Tucker, Dick Traney, and uh, Dean Gates because they were open and receptive to discussions, and we, we made a lot of uh, headway, and I think the, the best part of what I've seen is that we've, we've addressed what are the true problems. I mean, the handicap service was not, was not well done, uh, but these other things that have been changed uh, seem to make a marked improvement from the last uh, ordinance that was done by um, Mr. Begich and I forget somebody else in 2005. So this is this is good progress, and we thank them for their uh, attention and efforts. Uh, uh, thank you for your efforts. I know representing uh, in the interest of the industry and, and as well as the industry of folks for coming up with solutions and suggestions, and not just uh, throwing it off all, all off on whomever to try to make a decision and then complain about it. So thank, you. thank you, sir. Uh, anybody else that would like to say? Mark, hang on just a second. I'm going to Mr. O'Malley. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Dave O'Malley. I believe I had contact with him while up here, most recently with Mr. Traney on the subject. And first off, I just want to correct Mr. Traney. Mr. Coffey does not speak for the industry. I, you know, and Mr. Holman. He does not Maybe speaks for the towers he's next to, but that's really it. Okay. I've been involved now, well, over 30 years now with the basically all kinds of transportation in Alaska, mainly taxi and uh, vehicle for hire. And five years ago when I got back into the industry, I looked into buying a permit and I just saw how basically after the 90s when they did rewrite Title 11, how corrupt and outrageous a lot of Title 11 was and how the industry just came to the value of the permits overtook everything. My first priority was Try and get the municipality to issue more permits. 
basically to lower the price down, to improve service, and to open up opportunities. This should have been done three years ago when Char complained to the Assembly uh, Transportation Commission, and basically it died right here in the Public Safety Committee. Okay, last month, the municipality did auction off 15 permits with a windfall of over a million dollars for the municipality, and that's going to go a long way. The second thing I wanted was for the mayor or somebody on the assembly to appoint an independent arbiter to investigate the industry, the TI's office, and the Transportation Commission, which I was saying it was filled with waste, inefficiency, and corruption. Most everything was either redundant or just under the table and value of the permits was the main, virtually nothing else mattered. That controlled the industry. All right, and uh, complaints, okay, there was basically no competition between the two dispatch companies. Complaints never got past the call takers and from the public and the drivers. Finally, somebody got involved. That was Assemblyman, Assemblywoman Oceander. And after extensive research a lot of effort, a lot of time and money on the taxpayer's dime, she came up with the rewrite of Title 11. Basically, it opens up to the industry to not only competition, but makes drivers, permit owners, and dispatch companies more responsible. It brings accountability to the industry. Okay, it's not perfect, of course not. You could always pick apart a big amendment like Oceanus or the rewrite. But it addresses everything. It addresses what she wanted to inadequate service to outlying communities, service needs of persons with disabilities, public safety concern, a bar break, lack of cabs at peak hours, and cuts in bus services. And it also brings in the competition, and she produced a lot of data. I can show you data too that cities that have increased cabs and allowed market forces to balance the market have seen lower consumer fares and greater cab availability. So basically, after a lot of time and effort, somebody woman Oceander produced her rewrite. I really question Mrs. Mr. Traney how much time and effort and research he personally put in for that. Okay, the part about the front seat and his granddaughter, maybe. And I said every assembly member could pick apart something in Title 11. Mr. Ron, can I get you to summarize your points are? Right? Okay. At the last ATC meeting, I did question, uh, Mr. Marion was, Marion was there, two uh, members of the Transportation Commission, Bill Evans, he's a local attorney, the two newest members specialized in labor relationships, and Steve Radar of the hotel industry. I asked them if they reviewed the rewrite of Title 11, if they had any input into it, and if they approved it. They answered no to all three questions. I further asked Bernadette Bradley, of owner and manager of Bradley House, member of Char, and was on the board of Char. The same questions. She said no. Nothing to do with it. So basically, as I see this rewrite, it's just another, eff another effort to kill and install the whole amendment into oblivion. Keep the status quo and uh, basically kill the whole amendment. I don't see why you need a rewrite. I don't see much effort was put in this rewrite, and who did the rewrite? From what I know, the rewrite was Mr. Musser here and Attorney Jim Brennan. If anyone else had any input into it, I am not aware of it. The Transportation Commission had no input into it, and I don't know of anybody who had input into it. I don't know if Char had in input into it, if somebody representing the public had in input into it, but everything is addressed in Oceander's uh, amendment. What I'm asking this assembly to do is approve Oceander's, oh, I shouldn't say Oceander's, Assemblywoman Oceander's or Debbie Oceander's amendment as is. Any little window dressing or something could come afterwards. I don't agree with everything in Ose Oceander's uh, amendment either. I don't agree with the, what's really troubling the permit owners is after nine years they lose the value of the permits. I don't know anybody who's really in agreement with that. That's nine years down the road. What I'm asking is, Approve as is Senate Woman Oceander's amendment. Any little window dressing afterwards could be 
accomplished in plenty of time. Okay, any questions? No. Okay, we are running low on time. We do appreciate your information. I can assure you that there was a whole lot of people building into this uh, rewrite and this crafting of the ordinance. And yes, the Transportation Commission and many members of the public, including Charlie at the table, in the early on discussions pre buildup of this, of this ordinance. And I know that we were in, in, in many of the uh, conversations. I was in the room for many. Mr. Training took on the uh, task of rewriting. Well, changes from something you'll see Andrew's amendment or changes from the original the Title pick, 11? The, the pickup changes of the original Title 11, and we took a look at what we had, and was, the decision was that we would be rewriting what was there because the original sponsor and craft we, we could not find the sources of the re review at that point. So I, I can assure you there's many hours, many people were sitting at many tables before the actual meat and potatoes of putting something to eat on paper. Okay. What, I'm, I, what I'm really emphasizing is after something with Oceander's amendment to now. I'm yeah. not talking about the original. And, and that's what I'm, that's my point is the, the original Title 11 that exists today is right. being rewritten. Miss Oceander's was never implemented. So right. hers, right. we could not determine where her review and research came from other than Miss Oceander's comments. And she admitted there wasn't a whole lot of input. And so we, we started afresh with many members of the public, including many members of industry from CHAR. I don't want to debate the issue. I'm just telling you, I'm informing you, you had the question. I'm giving you the statement. Mr. Traney took up the attempt to put pen to paper with many members of, of staff and, and Mr. The Transportation Commission said put through uh, the Transportation Inspector. So okay. this, this document has many people's <coughs> fingerprints on it, and the actual pen to paper part was being done by the Municipal Attorney's Office and our Municipal Attorney, uh, I'm sorry, Assembly Attorney, who have uh, responsibility on this craft real estate. Okay. So we had Mr. Marion. I'm leaving off page. Yes. But we have, we have, many, said, we have a really short window now. Question the Transportation Commission. They told me they had no input in it. And I said, Mr. Marion was here when I questioned them. Okay, to correct an earlier statement, he came late to that meeting, and the meeting was already over with. Okay, uh, that's the full warrant of that. First of all, I want to commend Mr. Training and Gian on this, because the Acres public can live with this ordinance. Now, the Oceander Ordinance, that was kind of a spark to, to do all this. They can live with this ordinance. Okay, the public can live with it, Char can live with it, and the whole bit. Now, as far as the, the Char is concerned, we could take care of this whole mess in a completely different manner. Staggered bar closing. Now, that could be taken care of. Now, recessed vehicles, that's in here. We're not gonna have recessed vehicles anymore. Buster said that back in May. I actually agree with that. If you if you have a taxi cab that is totally 100% piece of garbage, it shouldn't be on the road anyway. Okay, and as far as the Transportation Commission, which I've been following for the past couple of years, I'll tell you this. We need the Transportation Commission. We need the oversight in the industry. The industry is actually asking for it. Okay. Now, as far as cabs, they should be required to be completely dispatched unless it is to the Anchorage Airport. As a former Alaska Yellow Cab Dispatch, I'll say my name for the record, M-A-R-K, M-A-R-I-O-N, I can tell you this. A lot of the times, the uh, cabs, I can tell you this, most of them are st stuck at the airport at 3 a.m. That's why their calls aren't getting cut. So if we have staggered bar closing, you take care of that. Whereas if you... Can, can we get to summarize real quick because we're going to have another topic to get into. Okay. I will summarize very shortly here. Um, Let's take that transit center, which is a scary place anyway, right across from uh, City Hall. Let's turn it into a parking lot. And let's include the old Inland Inn that's now a parking lot. Let's make it a cab place. Easy park during the day, cab park at night. Good idea. Thanks, sir. If you could summarize quickly.
appreciate um, Mr. Traney's effort and the Assembly's effort and what you're doing. However, Char was not involved in this part of the ordinance rewrite. Um, public safety totally left out of here, which was our main concern. The chief just stated that he was downtown. Cavs did not want to pick up people or our patrons. And I believe that public safety is an issue, not only downtown, but everywhere in our community. And that is a known fact. Eagle River, what's going to happen with Eagle River? Are we going to service Eagle River? Um, we are very concerned. We have members in Eagle River that would not even utilize the off-the-road program because no tech to get service. What are we going to do about that? What are we going to do really about the public safety? Is that being addressed in here? Absolutely not. And I would like to see it. On behalf of my members, I represent over 260 members in this city, and I believe almost 10,000 patrons in this city. We want the public safety. I want every creature that is out of my businesses to please go out of there and say, whether it's with a cab or with a friend. Safety hour is a plus, most definitely. But we need to have the tools in order for it to work. The other thing that I want to say is, um, you know, signage, Mr. Hahnemann, I do understand that you have made promises and we tried really hard, especially in the downtown area. I know that's been frustrated for our licensees downtown when they want to have the taxi cab loading zones, you know, there at night, so the taxi cab service is available. That hasn't happened. The um, bus depot downtown, again, you wanted to have that to be like a centralized area for people to walk to. That hasn't happened. The only thing that I see there is, you know, when you get a crowd of people into one area just waiting for cabs, they might be an argument if they're planning on keeping their cabs there you know, I was here first, no you weren't. And when people are a little intoxicated, they seem to lose sometimes the way of thinking. So that's just one precaution that we have there. Um, with what we are proposing, we want to service our own industry, which is all the hotels, all the motels, all the bars, restaurants, lounges, liquor stores, and I believe the ordinance does allow that. I don't know. How? O.C. Andrews does. O.C. Andrews does. This one does not. And we, we, uh, wait, hello, excuse me. We're I not going to have an I was talking. Thank <laughs> you to summarize. I am, I am. So, um, with all respect, we want to be able to work on this more. Could you make a suggestion, to perhaps address it to Mr. Training, Mr. Hall, and um, ourselves? Most definitely can. Most, most definitely can. Okay. I know we've got about three minutes, and I have one more matter on the agenda. And that's, that's all I have, and thank you for your time. Yes. Yeah, I'd like to move that we extend by 10 minutes. I don't want this plane to be a rush. I second. Any objections to doing this? Just one quick comment, if I may, Mr. Chairman. Yes, sir. Okay, um, first off, I think everybody knows. I'll be great guys and family members. I represent the interests of everybody in this community, everyone. And um, Ms. Uh, Villamides has some concerns, and I'm hoping that Mr. Cheney, um, since you are working on this ordinance, will uh, at least talk with her about it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Okay, thank you. So we will give moments, a few moments afterwards if there's somebody else who'd like to speak on this particular one. <coughs> Ms. Uh, Ms. Lane, if you'd come forward, please. And I apologize for your delay in waiting. I thank you for your patience. So this is a matter before the animal control concerns. And yes. Anybody else that you? What? It's not dinner. Time. Is there anyone <laughs> well, else? Well, some that you of us have? might be hungry. <laughs> is there anyone else here that you have? No, <laughs> I'm by myself, okay. Louise Lane. That is my name, and um, I kind of have a script because I'm not very good at this. So. I'm a longtime resident of Anchorage and I'm a longtime user of the municipality of Anchorage trail system as an athlete, a coach, and now as a recreational runner and skier. Why am I here today? I am concerned about the number of off leash, loose dogs on trails and school grounds within the municipality of Anchorage. 
By loose, I mean dogs that are off leash with the owner nearby, either within sight of the dog or just out of the sight of the dog, but with no leash control. After the third time this year, our leash dogs were attacked by unleashed, uncontrolled dogs, and this time my husband was bitten by the attacking dog, I decided to attend an animal control advisory board meeting. I was concerned that the advisory board was not aware of how often there are unleashed dogs on the hillside trails and the adjacent school grounds of Trailside and Service High School. I went to the animal control advisory board meeting on June 27th of this year. ACAB stated that they were aware of the problem, but they have only four or five officers to serve the entire municipality of Anchorage and therefore are unable to patrol trailheads and school grounds to issue citations of rules violations. I was told that animal control officers were only able to respond to calls and not able to patrol heavily used sections of the municipality trails or trailheads or school grounds. At the meeting, the ACAB suggested that I approach the Public Safety Committee with my concerns regarding off-leash dogs and the lack of animal control officers. After reading through the Animal Care and Control Services Strategic Plan of January 27, 2006, I discovered that one goal in the strategic plan was to have 15 animal control officers patrolling the municipality by the year 2011. Apparently, there are even less animal control officers, six and a half, in 2013 than there were in 2006, when there were seven officers and when the plan was made. What do I want? I would like to see animal control better able to enforce animal laws beyond just responding to emergencies. As stated in the strategic plan of 2006, this would be achieved by hiring more enforcement officers. I would like to see animal control officers patrolling on leash areas such as trailheads and heavily used portions of the municipality trails where violations of the rules most often occur. I would like to see more efforts to educate the public regarding rules and regulations for dogs on municipality of Anchorage trails, bike paths, and school grounds. Why should the Public Safety Committee care? This is a safety issue for everyone using the trail system, regardless of whether or not they have dogs. I have repeatedly heard from my neighbors on the hillside that they do not use the trail system anymore, not because of fear of wildlife, but fear of unleashed dogs attacking them their children, or their leashed pets. Dog bites are a public safety issue, and a mauling of a child is a possibility with off-leash dogs in school areas. Off-leash dogs also have the potential to harass wildlife, causing injury to wild animals or chasing bear or moose into other trail users. In closing, I actually got an email from the um, head of the Animal Control Advisory Board that said he'd sent a resolution um, to all of you for the operating budget for the municipality this year, um, re resolution 2013-04, and asking for another officer. So I just, I told him I would mention that, that he had sent that. They passed this, I think, on the 22nd of August. Um, I really thank you for your time. I. Um, I kind of got thrown into this by going to that other meeting and they said, why don't you go talk to you guys? And so I just wanted to make you aware of the problem. There, in fact, I ran this morning on the trails and there were four or five dogs that I saw off leash. Um, today, when I asked people to put their dogs on the leash, they were nice enough, most of them did. I also ran into one of my former skiers and um, I mentioned that I was coming to the meeting today. His daughter was attacked by an off-leash dog, pulled off of her bike, and had 13 stitches. Um, this, this happened a year ago. He asked if he could come and speak publicly today, but I wasn't sure how this all worked, so I told him I would just mention it. But eight, the advisory board seems to be really aware of this problem, and they're just like, we can't do anything. We don't have enough officers. We have the same or less than what we had in 2007. So I think that's my main point there. And I, I don't know what... We have two persons. Any other questions or comments? Mr. Trainer? 
just that I appreciate you coming here. We need to have you come and testify as we get in the budget cycle. Because here's the problem the last few years. We can appropriate money to American White Town. He's already said that he wants to reduce the budget this year by five million dollars from last year. Right. So no matter how much money we have put in the budget, let's go to the public there to demand that money get approved, not be vetoed, it'll be wiped out. Right. Another thing is I've heard from some of the people on the advisory commission, they want us to do away with the off-leash law. There's not a problem with dog parks that are off-leash, but there is a requirement that you don't have to have your dog on leash, you need to control it by voice command. The problem, everybody thinks little puppy won't bite people. Yeah. May not bite your family. For some cases <laughs> they will. The problem is, that's not something I'm sure we're ready to take on yet, but it's something that somebody does need to address. And what I need is for the Animal Control Advisory Board to come into us for a Title 17 rewrite that gets rid of the dogs off leash. That will get rid of half your problem. Oh, yeah, I, I totally for that. They walk through my, neighbor, <laughs> my neighborhood too, and they don't have their dogs on leash. When you tell them they're not under control, they so sure it is. Um, I, I just, I'm wondering, should I go back to the next Animal Control Advisory well, Board meeting them, and... Ask them specifically, have you guys looked at the issue of getting rid of the off-leash off dog law that allows the dogs to be controlled? But how do you have proof that dogs are under control? Yeah. They're not in any way. You won't know until it bites you. <laughs> Ms. Gray, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. First, I'd like to thank you for your patience sitting through all of this. Uh, also, I thank you for being here because the weekend I feel your pain. Um, and, and it's really, really sad that a lot of folks and some of us don't recognize that you know, our community is growing and you can't expect the same type of services for a community of 3,000, 300,000 as opposed to 200,000. It just doesn't make sense that we need to add another enforcement officer. And I'm glad we have a resolution from the um, advisory commission. And I'm not speaking for Mr. Traney, but I, I believe that we will join you and a budget amendment to add that position. But as he said, you have to come out and testify. And I'm sure Neil Conan will be out there testifying. You have to come out there and support what we're what we're trying to do. And so with that said again, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, uh, I appreciate you coming too. I know this is a real issue and actually I'm already working with our attorney in regards to this uh, off leash. So uh, you don't need to go back. It's already in my scope. Okay. Can I contact you by email just to make sure I know what's going on? Because I have people that are asking me if they, if they can publicly comment and okay. things like that. And so I, I'd like to kind of be able to, I don't know how this works, so I might email you and ask you what do I do or Please should I just do. wait? <laughs> what works is when uh, this comes before the body, Because there will be a lot of people that will be there to testify opposed to it. Right. Attorney Best said that the more people that can express their motivated, direct, functional target, like, let's fix this, and, they, and you've got tons of support, it might motivate some of us on the body to move to action. To move, right. to move to action. Okay. If we're not moved to action by support of our community, it may not happen. So okay. thank you for being here. I, I Okay, I will do that. Okay. I will do that. Any other matters? Um, we'll look, double back this moment. Is there anybody that would like to testify on this ordinance? The ordinance change? Um, I was, the work session on Friday. Yes. Um, will we be able to participate in the work session on Friday, or is it just going to be assembly people? It's assembly. So if we have input that we wanted to... Uh, Suggest that even at this late date, we could email you with email that. You. Okay. okay. Anybody else? But Sir? no personal on that, right? Excuse me. No personal on the work session. No personal comments. No. <clears throat> not not no personal uh, testimony allowed. Okay. But at the assembly meeting, it's part of the hearing for sure. Okay. Good afternoon. I am George Rendon, R E N D O N. And the reason I am here to, I try to go back with assembly members to whatever commitments and the small issues we talked before by, by writing and give to few assembly members. But anyway, the reason today 
I am here. I hear a lot of comments to whatever what happened on the street, the, the no no taxis in the night. And not, the point is no drivers. Taxi, we have enough taxis on the street. We have a lot of, lot of taxi to make outside. But the point is we don't have drivers. And the, the reason we don't have drivers is for, because there's no business. And if the driver, if the driver is not go to work, it's because there's no business. First point and the second point is to the leases is to money. Anyway, I like to talk about the title 11, the rewrite Mr. Training is talking about. And I suggest to the, to the members of the assembly it as is possible to extend the time because I believe to, we need to talk to Mr. Eric and the Transportation Commission members to we have some members, minority people, at least with two different languages. First point, to make it for sure to everybody understand this one. And maybe also we need to two or three languages in the Title 11 to the people try to be for one of those permits to know what is the rules and regulations. Third point. Okay, the, the third point is to, we have a, we have a uh, lot of people to make a, some big bidding from the tax permits to go to 90, 91,000 bucks. And we don't know, I don't, I don't think, to any regular driver we have in the road, have a two or three thousand bucks in, in the checking account. Then I suggest to the, to the commission to make some investigation, the money coming from where? That's the first point. And the second point, I don't believe to the bidding system work in this city, because the city is running by the drivers. And then, if we put in the whole drivers for some reward, some, some decent money, I think we, we can make it. The whole drivers to watch in the whole the city. When any crime coming in progress, call to a dispatch. But we have to support the drivers by, by the commission or whatever we have to make a better living. I complain about to this to this point few times. I saw some drivers in the welfare office not have money, no money to pay the lease, <coughs> and also not have a put in this home, no have money to pay the to, to pay the, the place to, to live in. Then, that, then this is the the main problem we have right here is the drivers. I come in behind to the drivers because when I started right here in Anchorage in 2000, in 1974, I started to drive. Second, I become to the permit the owner. The owner in, in those times, we have some permits, and the city, he's give away, no charge, nothing, only we have to pay the, only we have to pay the, renew the, the, the paper, and you can, you can work, you're responsible for the car, for maintenance, for all this kind of stuff. But to pay 91,000 bucks, that's it, that's it. Mr. Rennan, if, if, if you could uh, help us uh, with the information to get in contact to Mr. Uh, Training and, and this, the committee here on some of your suggestions and concerns. Uh, and I don't know if you're aware, we're, we are doing a work session on Friday. What uh, I'm challenged by, and I certainly wish we could do something about the language issue on the ordinance, and I don't know how we would address that, but Mr. Musser would make that we'll find some way to way we could find perhaps an agency or two that could volunteer helping us translate this to uh, people that are drivers or permit holders that make crime, not English being the second language. Okay, Mr. Paul, uh, my, last, my last thing, I'd like to ask to the commission or the Mr. Eric if we can find a son or owners and to involve and make a some work section to see how we can help to rewrite the title 11. To make a help 
to the city and the, the city and the, and the, and the business also to, to make a better living for the drivers. This should be on the website to the clerk's office as soon as we notice the public right. here. When it's introduced, when it's introduced, I believe. Right here, Tuesday, Wednesday. Okay. So okay. thank you. If you could be, make sure we get it. We are on uh, the time extension, and I was looking at the time on the clock of this, so we're now two minutes over. So this meeting is officially over, 214 p.m.